Good evening and welcome to our annual meeting with the Board of Edu with, the, with the Montgomery County Board of Education and the Montgomery County Association of Administrators and Principals. This evening you will see that we are continuing to meet virtually. We absolutely want to make certain that we continue to remain safe and, um, and um, healthy. And so we thought that this meeting was so important that we wanted to make certain that we continue on with what we normally do every year. And so we are meeting via Zoom. Tonight you are going to hear from um, the CAP and all the, one of the wonderful things that they have done um, throughout um, this school year to help support MCPS. You will hear several brief presentations and I'm happy to say that we are joined by Montgomery County Board of Education members, by MCAT members and by MCPS staff. I'm gonna try to make certain that we move the meeting um, along very efficiently. And so I'm gonna ask board members to hold all your questions and comments until after you've heard the presentations. Um, we are really looking forward to a very engaging discussion this evening. And so at this time, if I can ask my colleagues to introduce themselves and I will first start with Vice President Wolf. Good evening. My name is Brenda Wolf and I represent District 5. And can we hear next from Dr. Daca? Good evening, Judy Daca, District 1. 
Mrs. O'Neill. Good evening, Pat O'Neill, District 3. And Ms. Silvestre. Good evening, Carla Silvestre, school board member at large. Okay, and Mrs. Smondrowski. Okay, so maybe she hasn't joined us yet. And so I will say that um, I definitely wanna acknowledge McBoa as well. So please forgive me for not saying that in the very beginning. Um, Ms. Dixon is feeling a little bit under the weather. So she will not be joining us this evening. And Mr. Asante had a prior, a, a prior engagement, but he wanted to also um, send his regrets. And we will make certain that we inform all of our colleagues that are not on the, that are not on the Zoom today of the discussion. And I want to just recognize that we have our superintendent, Dr. Jack Smith, on the Zoom, as well as our deputy superintendent, Dr. Modifa McKnight. And so at this time, I will turn it over to your president, Dr. Christine Handy, to give remarks and, and start our program off. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Good evening, members of the MCPS Board of Education. Dr. Smith, Superintendent of Schools, Dr. McKnight, McCap and McBoa, Board of Directors, McCap and McBoa members, and our community guests. My name is Christine Handy, and I proudly serve as the President of the Montgomery County Association of Administrators and Principals, McCap, and the Montgomery County Business and Operation Administrators, McBoa. We are pleased to have this opportunity to meet with the Board of Education this evening to share how McCap and McBoard members are leading with excellence in a pandemic. Past, from March to July, present, from July to today, and the future as we are planning for returning to in-school instruction. Leadership matters. Tonight, you will hear from McCap and McBoard members who represent various departments within MCPS. They will share powerful stories describing the leadership that has been imperative for MCPS to implement continuity of learning for more than 160,000 students in the midst of a worldwide pandemic. Leadership matters. Our job as leaders is to inspire hope through challenging times, to let our employees, colleagues, and school community know that although we must do things differently and innovatively, we will thrive. And we will lead through this and every day find ways to make everything and everyone around us better because leadership matters. We have a full lineup this evening, so we're going to get started. And first up, we have we will hear from Ms. Jeannie Dawson, Director of Materials Management. Jeannie. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about the leadership and collaboration and excellence of DMM and McCap and McBoa leaders, as well as um, what we have done in our co collaboration with our SEIU leaders and colleagues in this unprecedented time. When we began this journey on Friday, the 13th of March, myself and leadership teams within DMM quickly realized that the leadership practices and the organizational processes that got us here were not going to be the same as the leadership practices and organizational processes that get us there. When we walked out the door on Monday morning, March 16th, we had to pivot on a dime. What soon became the terms pivot and stand up would be predicated by the concepts really of agility, adaptability, innovation, resilience, and hope. So here's a high velocity account of the DMM journey. We begin with the Department of Materials Management. Our motto is we provide. Up at the top are my colleagues in our meme form. We decided to start a bi-weekly newsletter to engage our workforce and to be more communicative. And we do that every two weeks. Our department considers all of these different areas of procurement, the supply warehouse, property control, media processing, instructional materials, the Taylor Science Center, the Division of Food and Nutrition, editorial graphics, and publishing. We begin with the modernized, revitalized schools and revitalizations of furniture and upgrades, including security vestibules. We did not stop any of our work. From April, May, June, July, and August, we kept moving, and we also saw that the trucks and supply chain could be limited. 
When we began this, this is what we begin with, a chart. A chart that re leads with an idea of how we move it into furniture and the furniture becomes real for students and staff. We had Seneca Valley. We did innovative um, ideas with them. We were setting up all four floors. We worked with Tilden and many other schools. We also worked security vestibules. All of this was continuing April through August. We did newly installed counters with those vestibules. We also did surplus furniture donations and pickups with staff. And then this is where we began with the Lincoln Center, with our warehouse. We had 11 projects. They were the most amount of projects that we've had to stand up in Montgomery County Public Schools history, and including the second largest high school on the Eastern Seaboard, Seneca Valley High School. We emptied two buildings so that planned construction could move forward at no extra cost. We did over 300 teacher transfers. We did 56,000 order lines pulled and delivered during the summer. And we had multiple tractor trailer loads of donated furniture because we knew that we wanted to work with our community, but also save as much as we could for the county. We had great low pricing because we had extremely large PPE orders to do on a dime. We had hundreds of thousands of masks, tens of thousands of hand sanitizer, tens of thousands of, of um, just about any kind of product you can imagine. And we are still on a daily basis trying to procure for our staff and students. We have not stopped the pony service. We do this every day. We still continue bulk mailings and trying to relocate with guidelines. We do shredding and we do short order moves. We continue to work with Benchmark and Eureka. Um, these are just some of the materials that you see here that we actually deliver. And we've worked with um, the deliveries of over 1.6 million paper copies on March 13th through 16th in order to get the students something in their hands before they left that day. In the print shop, we continue to work with all schools and we are still doing copy plus for schools and custom printing. We also do graphics and publications and one of the most valuable pieces of paper that we got out in the spring was our high school diplomas. Little did we know when we were being innovative in the fall with our supervisors about what could we do for gym floors and working with athletics, we came up with ideas about logos, but they soon quickly turned into the idea of a PP floor logo. Copy Plus continues to work and get things out for us. And in the field, you'll see some of the things that we use. We created with EGPS, the walk up meal service guidelines that show people how to walk up to us. We were delivering all of the materials here. And this was our instructional packet delivery that went in the spring and in the summer. In procurement, we again, we continue to work on bids and contracts. We have our leader here with 12 staff members that are in charge of so many things. Contracts and suppliers, public auction, the switch to the MCPS hub, the vendor products, catalogs, purchasing card, and all trainings that work for that, including all of the PPE supplies and being innovative with what we actually procured. We uh, actually have an average of 32,000 POs a year. We worked with the Office of the General Counsel because we had over 100 extra MOUs, IMUs, and professional service agreements that had to be amended or constructed due to the COVID switch to the virtual learning environment. And we have a number of new, renewed, and extended contracts of about 458, valuing over $344 million a year. Uh, finally, when we go to the DFNS warehouse, um, again, we continue to work on our ethnic and culturally diverse food. Uh, we try to maintain an economic viability and our commitment to sustainability. We have the facility. It is the only one of its kind in the state of Maryland where we have production, pre-plate, and warehouse. In this, we are self-supporting fund. Normally, we would be serving 100,000 meals a day or 18 million meals a year. Prior to COVID, now we had to leave the National School Lunch Program and enter into the Summer Food Service Program, which changes the entire way that we work. We're now curbside, we're outside, and we're there every day. We started off on March 16th with 
20 sites that had to be organized in three days. So that turned into 62 million, uh, uh, sorry, 62 meal distribution sites. And with our colleagues in transportation, we were able to put 10 mobile sites in. We continued daycare and worked with parks and recreations. We had four point, almost four and a half million meals served by the end of the summer. This is what we used to look like before COVID. This is what we look like now, and we are still trying to serve our families and be there every day. We have increased our community partners that we meet with on a regular basis, weekly now, and this has been a wonderful, wonderful commitment to work with. Finally, we have uh, currently, we are serving breakfast, lunch, supper, and snacks. We have 79 school sites, 10 best sites, 22 daycares, and that continues to increase on a regular basis. We've served 1.5 million meals at this point since August 31st. Our total meal distribution since March 16th is over 6 million meals. And our mantra being we provide our <laughs> song is we will serve you based on Queen song, we will rock you. <laughs> wow, Jeannie. <laughs> That's a lot. All right. Next up, we have Mr. Todd Watkins, Director of Transportation. Good evening, everybody. So I just want to share with you a little bit of what the Department of Transportation has been doing while we're not transporting students uh, during virtual learning. Just give you a little taste of the, the many non-traditional ways that we uh, have been involved in, in virtual learning. So we've been involved in food security of many types. As Jeannie mentioned, we've been helping with daily meal sites um, throughout the process. We were big time involved with the USDA produce boxes, um, delivering thousands and thousands of those every week uh, until they started, until they added meat and dairy in them. And then they kind of put us out of business because we don't have refrigerated buses. We continue to work with MANA and Women Who Cares Ministries and many other community partners in distributing food, uh, weekend bags, and other types of food. Uh, we have done lots of Chromebook distribution from the, the massive distributions uh, early on uh, in, the, in the spring to uh, handing them out daily now at uh, 45 and 15 West Goody. We also did home deliveries of iPads during the summer for the Montgomery Can Code camp. Uh, we did personalized deliveries for every, every registrant of that camp. We had a large part in the school building closeout we went in, we packed up schools and got them ready to, uh, to close out. We packed up student supplies and we were part of the distribution to students so they could come and pick up their materials. We also now are part of the uh, re getting re school buildings ready to reopen uh, once we go back to in-person learning. We are helping to set up the model schools now and we'll continue to uh, assist with all the other schools getting them ready for physical distancing. We inv were involved in the educational packet distribution that Jeannie talked about with EGPS. Uh, they printed them and we took them to sites and distributed them. We are working on science kits now. In fact, we, we picked up science kits today and distributed those to middle schools from um, uh, all over the county. We also are working with several schools and having buses in neighborhoods. We go and pick up materials and staff members from schools and we go out into the neighborhoods and help them uh, connect with their communities. We have delivered therapeutic equipment to uh, students' homes. We did this from some of our special schools where we uh, went in and got uh, specialized wheelchairs and walkers and other things that students need for distance learning at home. And we delivered those to families along with the staff from those schools. We are providing lots of language interpretation services all over the place for lots of these efforts. We particularly folks need Spanish speakers, but we've done numerous other language languages also as schools have requested uh, folks that are bilingual in many, many languages. We are serving in the classroom, in some cases in the virtual classroom, as we are using transportation staff to fill in for vacant uh, paraeducator positions. We've been in buildings changing out, uh, helping the Division of Maintenance change out uh, HVAC filters to prepare for better COVID ventilation. We have been providing monitors for SAT administrations. And soon we have, we're starting a bookmobile effort. We have a number of schools now that are 
uh, working with students, they check out the books online and we are going to take buses and go distribute those books to uh, stops in the neighborhood where the students can come pick up the materials that they checked out online. And of course, our non-COVID related work, we're using this time, we've switched over many of our IT systems uh, to updated, uh, updated systems during this downtime. And we also are preparing to return to in-person uh, transportation in a number of ways, determining what physical distancing looks like on the bus. And we still have some decisions to make there, uh, whether it's one student per seat or one in every other seat. Uh, we have, we're creating routes or starting the process of creating routes for the small group return, hopefully in January, and then an AB hybrid model in February. All that is, is kind of revamping what we've done and what we have in transportation. We are a largely SEIU department with over 2,000 members. And so in the efforts that, that you see, all these things I talked about, you see lots of SEIU members and they do a great job. But the point I wanna to make tonight in this McCap McBella presentation is that every one of those activities takes a significant amount of coordination and supervision from McBoa and or McCap members of our department. In all of these activities, we're partnered with other MCPS entities or community agencies or other governmental agencies. And that in itself takes lots of coordinating work by our McBoa and McCap members. And to quote my new boss, Essie, by the way, thank you for her. Uh, she's a great boss. Uh, she said one day in a meeting, the only way we aren't allowed to do it is the way we know how to do it. I don't know whether that was original or borrowed, uh, but I know it's a tremendous way of summing up the fact that all the things that used to be routine and run like clockwork don't run that way anymore. And now figuring out how they do work takes significant leadership. And that's what's provided by our McBoa and McCap members. Thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you, Todd. Next up we have Seth Adams, Director of Facilities Management. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to, uh, to present tonight. Um, so I'm, I'm following my uh, colleagues in operations and, and uh, figured I would just change uh, the, the approach a little bit. Um, you know, certainly, you know, the Department of Facilities Management has, has had a heavy lift from the beginning. Um, you know, we, we really haven't stopped, as, as, as you've all heard. Um, construction has continued. Maintenance has continued. Um, but one of the things that I did want to talk about um, is, is from a leadership standpoint, from the McCap McBoa perspective, um, is, is the leadership that's had to take place in order to you know, continue to, the, to move the work forward. Um, you know, I, I know from, from all of us where, you know, there's, there's no one on this, this call tonight that hasn't had a COVID related impact. Um, everyone's had challenges. And, you know, so for me, it's, it's not as much, it's not as important to talk about the challenges we've had, but it's important to talk about um, you know, the great efforts that have taken place to, to move beyond that. I can say again, from an operations standpoint, it, it really did start with um, the team approach. Ms. McGuire that is on the call, you know, she set, it, set, set things forward with a family approach. You know, family first, people first. Uh, that's what's most important. Um, and that has trickled, trickled down. I can tell you with, with our building service members, with our maintenance members, construction, um, there's fear. There has been fear, and there continues to be fear. So to uh, to pretend it's not there is 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 not reality. Um, and and certainly, um, you know, from a leadership standpoint, there's not a there's not a manual for how to, to work through a pandemic. Just like, you know, for for Dr. Smith, there's no superintendent manual of how to run a school system through a pandemic. This is this is real world work, and and for us, it is successful because we're all working together, we're all leaning on one another, um, and we all are caring for one another. I would also say one other um, element that really has surfaced is, is, is from the com community perspective. Um, as much as sometimes we don't wanna pretend or we don't wanna you know, acknowledge that you know, some of the challenges that are around us exist in the workplace, they do. You know, facilities management, um, We've had a lot of conversations around racial, racial injustice. We've had a lot of conversations around classism, around gender inequality. Um, these are all things that you know, the, the team has, has, has really addressed head on. And it's through that people first perspective. Um, we've had leadership meetings and probably more than I'd like to admit where 
tears have been shed. We, we have had real conversations. We've had, um, you know, those, those challenging, difficult conversations around, you know, what are the issues and what are we going to do to move forward? You know, we're, we're not going to stand here and, and, you know, pretend it doesn't exist. We're going to address it head on and we're, we're going to do everything that we can to fix it. You know, we've worked, you know, really hard. And I, I would say that has been probably one of the biggest success stories, really hard at partnering with our SEU partners. You know, that is, I think of anything, um, the partnerships that have developed to really focus on safety, to, to focus on well be, well-being, to focus on professional growth and opportunities. Uh, that, that has been a success story for us. And, and I thank, you know, our, our obviously Dr. Handy um, from McCat McBoa. I, I thank the SEIU leadership. But more importantly, um, I really want to thank our, our McBoa leadership and all of our SEIU employees that, that, that do the work within facilities management. Obviously, they, they, they will, will do anything to support the Board of Education, anything to support Dr. Smith. And you know we are we are here with you for you, um, and we look forward to continuing the work and and moving forward to uh, to getting schools open and in a safe way. So thank you again very much for the opportunity. All right, thank you, Seth. All right, next up we're going to switch gears a little here. We're going to go with Mr. Scott Murphy, Director of College and Career Readiness and Districtwide Programs. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good to see everyone and here representing curriculum and instruction. And uh, I just want to start by acknowledging the comment that was made yesterday at the Board of Education meeting about the Rubik's Cube, uh, because that's certainly what it's been since day one, past, present and future and in, in our world in curriculum instruction, you know, ever since probably a good two, three week, two, three weeks before uh, March 13th, um, we all started to see some things coming and just so proud of the way that our supervisors, our coordinators, our specialists in curriculum and instruction swung into action. Um, we all remember those early days uh, when the crisis hit and we're responding by, by putting together packets of materials um, that our colleagues in operations printed in record time and then delivered to every single one of our schools, our, our, our curriculum teams you know, really 24 seven developing online modules and assessments and curriculum materials for teachers to use right away um, when the pandemic first hit. Um, plus doing work we've never done before, like developing frameworks for an online learning schedule, the grading and reporting uh, adjustments that we, we brought to you in the spring, um, the continuity of our programs, uh, just maintaining continuity of programs that must continue even while we're virtual. Um, all these things continued um, right on into the summer. Um, and just frankly, uh, what I saw is just heroic work by our supervisors, coordinators, and our specialists in curriculum. That led us to the summer, uh, which as you know, was, was pretty much an all time record of numbers of students and students who were involved in summer programs and uh, teachers and staff who were running those summer programs in all of our schools. And again, just uh, you know, the largest operation summer school wise we've ever done. And we really think, you know, was certainly called for, needed, um, but just the amazing work that happened to stand that up uh, with, you know, pretty much with, without a whole lot of lead time, as we all know. Taking us to the here and now as we all try to, to make the virtual learning experience better uh, for our students, responding to the feedback we're hearing from the community to make that better, that Rubik's Cube, now looking to the future that, that not only is, um, you know, the sort of the, on the horizon with returning students to in-person experiences, but really looking ahead even beyond next semester and next year, because we all know that we're gonna be recovering from this for, for a good long while, as will our students, most importantly. Um, I just really wanted to also acknowledge that none of that, none of that happens, as was said by my colleagues, without, without strong leadership. And I think, you know, one of the things I appreciate about the way we do business in MCPS is, the value of collaboration. So all of those things that we that I just overviewed, you know, the constant cycle of talking to principals and wanting to know what they think, talking to teachers, talking to parents, talking to you, the board, engaging the community, you know, that's all happening behind the scenes as we bring some of the concepts and plans to you. Um, and also, I just want to give our our folks credit for also how how we have have really tried our best to take care of people during this difficult time. 
we're all working so hard. We're all working 24 seven, but at the end of the day, our people really matter. And um, I want to acknowledge our, my colleagues for the way that we've um, valued those relationships and valued um, the important work that our people do. And, you know, it, it never stops, it never will. And, you know, our commitment is, is to, to continue to do that on behalf of our district. Um, but again, just want to acknowledge the, the great leadership that has been shown to make all of that happen. Some of it people see, some of it people don't. Um, but at the end of the day, as was said earlier, uh, leadership may, puts it all together. And also you'll hear later from our principals um, and you know, they really, I just ha hats off to our principals, to our school leaders for everything that we do in central office and how, how you then implement it um, at your schools. So that's just a, a brief summary um, from curriculum and instruction and to the board members uh, yesterday um, I, at the conclusion of the meeting, you uh, pretty clearly uh, gave a thank you uh, for all the hard work that's been put in. And I wanted you to know that people hear that our supervisors, our coordinators, our, 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 our specialists hear that and appreciate um, that acknowledgement. So thank you. All right, thank you, Scott. Next up, we have Dr. Kara Trinkamp, Director of Technology, Integration and Learning Management Systems. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here. It's always an exciting time to work in the technology office. Uh, but the last uh, eight months have been an extraordinary time with, uh, with all of the changes and unprecedented challenges that we faced. Um, I'm here to share um, how proud I am of the leaders in the technology office um, as they've worked to reimagine and rebuild the schoolhouse. Uh, a couple themes that I want to touch on um, that have really surfaced over the last eight months. Um, they've required out of the box thinking, risk taking, tireless meetings, planning sessions, critical reviews of any plans and great ideas we thought we had, and countless hours of working late into the nights, weekends, and through holidays to try to put things in place for our schools, our students, our parents, our communities. It's been hard. Leaders in the technology office gathered their teams together and created strategic partnerships in order to find solutions to problems we had never faced with very short time, a very short runway to get up and running. Over the last eight months, we've needed to think differently about how we work, when we work and where we work. We have had to think differently about how we use money and our time. And most importantly, we've had to depend on our relationships and our work together to ensure success. And this last part was particularly challenging because we no longer were all in the same place. So we actually had to use the technology that we were trying to stand up in order to collaborate, communicate, connect, and get the work done in ways that we had never done before. When you think about technology, one of the first things that probably comes to mind, especially in MCPS, is Chromebooks. And for good reason. MCPS has distributed more than 120,000 Chromebooks to students and staff since March. On March 26th and 27th alone, more than 50,000 Chromebooks were distributed across 180 distribution sites. Just think about those numbers for a minute. Think about the coordination planning and collaboration that needed to take place to pull that off. Supervisors in the technology office spent hours and days putting teams together to gather technology from schools, transport it to distribution sites, clean it, configure it, and get it ready to hand out. They partnered with our colleagues in construction, facilities, and transportation to staff the sites, and they trained staff to run the checkout process. Our leaders led efforts to reconcile inventory sheets, set up technology support hubs for parents, students, and staff, and rethink staff schedules so that we could accommodate the long days and extended hours that were needed to support parents, students, and staff. Our McCat McBoa leaders rolled up their sleeves and were often seen taking technology to homes and setting up distributions out of the backs of their cars and trucks in empty parking lots. Most importantly, our supervisors had to ensure safe working conditions for our teams, 
so that work could, kill, could continue to move forward and their teams knew that their safety was a priority. Very shortly after school buildings closed in mid-March, the world saw demand for technology like they'd never seen before. Critical shortages in laptops, Chromebooks, document cameras, and internet hotspots were so pervasive that many school districts could not move forward with a virtual learning plan. While MCPS is feeling some of this impact of the critical shortages right now with delayed orders for replacement technology, we were able to anticipate and buy what we needed to stand up virtual learning within a matter of weeks. This required us to rethink our budgets and our spending plans, anticipate what we needed and start working the phones with our vendor partners to get in touch with folks that could help us immediately to procure what we needed. Leaders in the technology office quickly secured more than 8,000 document cameras, more than 12,000 hotspots, and more than 20,000 student Chromebooks to help with our virtual learning. This quick thinking and planning provided MCPS with the equipment they needed so that all staff and students could fully participate in the virtual learning model from the very beginning. Moving to a virtual model in a matter of two weeks was a little tricky <laughs> and a little challenging. Leaders in the technology office in partnership with colleagues in curriculum and instruction conceptualized and built basically the new classroom. We quickly moved from the what we knew as the classroom to the class Zoom. Purchasing the district-wide district video conference platform, getting it configured within a week, and then providing professional development to everyone who needed to use it was no small task. It was the leadership of our systems integration team that found solutions for how we could set up Zoom safely. They shared these solutions with the Zoom staff and even with other districts around us, enabling other districts to stand up safe solutions as well. So they not only led our district, but they led other districts and the nation that were using these tools. In the classrooms, traditionally, students had used binders to store notes and assignments and agenda books. In the new virtual model, we partnered with curriculum to create the digital notebook, My MCPS Classroom. This is where teachers could pass out papers, post announcements, collect assignments, organize calendars. This is where students could go and do their work. They could connect with one another. The landing pages in my MCPS classroom became the new digital bulletin board. It was in this space that curriculum teams could build and push weekly lessons for reading and math to all teachers and students across the district. And our leaders partnered with the curriculum and instruction leaders to make that happen. Technology professional development teams quickly set up more than 75 courses to help teachers, staff, parents and students learn how to use these technologies and engage effectively. The last eight months have been filled with innovative and creative problem solving. When the district implemented a pass fail grading system for marking period four last spring, the leaders in technology put their teams to work to find ways to collect student and parent input on grade choice. Within a week, an app was developed. That's unprecedented, by the way. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't normally happen in a week. Um, other challenges presented themselves. We uh, helped to support the other Maryland districts in enrolling students uh, in uh, schools with no one in the buildings. How would parents come and enroll their kids in our school systems? One exceptional challenge that I do need to mention has been launching a new student, student information system, gradebook and parent portal in the middle of a pandemic. The leadership from the student systems team has been extraordinary as they have continued to lead the launch of this massive comprehensive system. I am so proud of the leaders that I work with every day within my office and across offices, and I appreciate the opportunity to share our work. Thank you. Wow. Uh, uh, wow. <laughs> you are truly enlightening, enlightening me tonight. So next up we have Dr. Karen Cruz, 
Director, Student Wellbeing and Achievement, Office of Student Family Support and Engagement. Wow, that was a lot. Great, thank you, Dr. Handy. Thank you for this opportunity to present this evening. Student and Family Support and Engagement in the Office of Teaching, Learning, and Schools consists of pupil personnel and attendance services, psychological services, school counseling, restorative justice, student family and school services, international admissions, and student health and wellness. As COVID-19 moved into our lives, our communities, our homes, we as a district moved into action and we immediately began working on how to support our students and families. We realized we had to address the safety and psychological needs of students in order for learning to take place. One of the hardest tasks we have faced during the pandemic is the gravity of overcoming the trauma endured by our youth. We are dealing with social isolation and many of our students are experiencing anxiety and quite frankly, worrying about school. With this being said, we have really worked to seek ways to help students and families feel a sense of connection with school during these unprecedented and uncertain times. So to address these needs, we provided the following resources, social emotional learning, our mental health fair, student well-being teams, the Waymaking series, Parent Academy to Go, and the Signs of Suicide Prevention Program. Some of these resources were created as a result of COVID-19 and others were a part of the existing Be Well 365 initiative and we made adjustments to some of those components. SEL, Social Emotional Learning. As you know, everyone around the country was dealing with this and looking for ways to support the social emotional learning needs of students. The challenge for us involved providing SEL lessons, materials, and resources that are typically used face-to-face. -face. Now we had to move those materials to a virtual learning environment. This required a great deal of collaboration and leadership from our directors and administrators in both at the student and family support and engagement and other central offices and schools. During the initial phase of planning, we spent a lot of time developing teams and research, researching programs and resources that were available for support. We held over 50 meetings since April, both weekly and often twice a week. During those meetings, we had to focus on keeping up with the ongoing changes occurring in our society with the pandemic, racial injustices, and concerns around the presidential election. We spent many hours researching SEL organizations uh, and lessons, consulting with local school districts and national organizations such as the National Association of School Psychologists and the American School Counselor Association. Mental Health Awareness Week. Due to COVID, we had to be creative and find ways to have the fair in a virtual space. This event is designed to educate staff, students, and caregivers about the importance of mental health. And this is especially important now as we navigate COVID. The directors and administrators in psychological services, communication, student leadership, student well-being and achievement, all work together to organize this event. Over the course of two months, months they put in over 3,200 hours of planning. The team is continuing to meet and trying to discuss plans for the website and outreach with outside agencies. This is just a snapshot of the many hours that were spent in developing and putting together the Mental Health Awareness Week. Our student well-being teams. Student well-being teams were developed to provide social emotional support for our students in schools. Monitoring and supporting the teams require daily planning and problem solving from student and family support and engagement leaders. In addition, there are many MCAT members across multiple offices and schools engaged in identifying student needs and providing support from inside MCPS and by utilizing our outside agencies. We are also currently working on an outreach campaign for in-person outreach to increase engagement. Next is our Waymaking series. 
The Waymaking series provided information and continues to provide information from local and national experts on how to change the mindset and stigma around mental health. Our psychological services and communications directors and other administrators started this work in April. We currently have 29 videos and each 15 minute episode takes five hours to complete. Each of our live one and a half hour events take 60 hours of planning. We continue to have weekly uh, pre-production meetings with staff to develop new ideas, and, to con and we continue to create videos based on student, family, and staff needs as they arise during the year. Next, we have our family engagement. Our student family services and international office, um, International Admissions and Enrollment Office has been instrumental in leading the efforts of moving the Parent Academy, also known as Parent Workshops, to a virtual platform and now offers three options, parent workshops, parent chats, and how-to videos that are all archived on our website in multiple languages. This work involves weekly meetings as well as consultation with parents and offices on presentation topics. Under the leadership of the director, the parent community coordinators, coordinators have had over 10,000 interactions with families and over 70% of those interactions were with ESOL families. In addition, they provide many hours of support to school-based administrators to problem solve situations that arise with families. Also, most recently, many hours were spent collaborating and providing the Parent Academy for parent conferences in multiple languages. Several MACAP members were involved in planning and implementing this event. And then lastly, our Signs of Suicide Prevention Program, also known as SOS, um, provides suicide prevention lessons for our students in schools. The student and family support and, and, and engagement team spent 10 hours a week to develop and provide these lessons. Um, we also spent time updating the staff training, updating family training, and that included recordings of the trainings in multiple languages, and also updating student lesson materials and resources for principals. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for this opportunity. All right, thank you, Dr. Cruz. Going to the schoolhouse now. First up, we have Mrs. Nora Dietz, principal of Captain James E. Daly Elementary School. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, members of the board, Dr. Smith and Dr. McKnight. Thank you for meeting with us this evening. I'm humbled to be representing the elementary administrators. Eight months ago, everything changed. I remember having 30 staff members in my office listening to Governor Hogan's announcement about the two week shutdown. From that moment on, elementary principals began to reimagine the work so our students could continue to learn. The sudden switch from brick and mortar to virtual learning was a monumental feat, which we have led with grace and trust, tears and sleepless nights. The term instructional leader has new meaning. We recognize that we could not be instructional leaders if students did not have the tools to learn and if our staff members did not have the virtual instructional skills and materials to teach from their homes. We learned how to Zoom and Google Meet, and we rallied our leadership teams, and with the support from Central Office, we've made it happen. As elementary leaders, never did we ever think that we would lead our schools from our offices and homes. Never did we ever think we would lead mass Chromebook distributions and become tech experts or learn new platforms like Synergy. Never did we ever imagine pulling together a virtual summer school program in a short amount of time designed differently at each school and end up with the largest summer school enrollment ever. Yes, without us, that would not have happened. Never did we ever think we could manage an Amazon warehouse from our cafeterias and gyms. The skeleton crews we've inventoried, unpacked, and organized hundreds and hundreds of boxes of materials. We've bagged materials for students and planned for material distribution. We organized materials for staff pickups. 
At my school, I have 600 students. My colleagues who lead large elementary schools and sole administrator schools face more challenges than I did with these important tasks. Never did we ever think that we would lead and roll out a new mathematics and reading curriculum during a pandemic. Never did we ever foresee the challenges with virtual map testing, district assessments and grading and reporting. Elementary administrators will share that we lost valuable instructional time during the map test administration. The challenges were huge for staff, students and parents and the results were not reliable. In January, on the 4th of January, by the way, the first day back from winter break, the testing window will open again. And this time it's only 14 days long. We have to ask why. Administrators want to protect instructional time. If the data we get is unreliable, then let's work together on a better way to gather data. Never did we ever think we would be immersed in detective work, such as locating families so we could support their needs with materials and internet connectivity issues so students can be engaged and learn. So never did I ever think I would host a night, the night before school starts Zoom story time with Mrs. Dietz or experience a line of parents that show up at daily every day to get food for their children or host a drive-by flu shot clinic, or have a learning hub in my school with 60 students now, and I can't walk through those classrooms to support learning or get a high five or a hug. Never did I ever think I'd be calling Jeannie Dawson about PPE materials. Jeannie, did I get the masks? Jeannie, what do I do with the boxes of gallon-sized hand sanitizer I just received? Jeannie and her team are always gracious and helpful. Never have I ever seen the level of social emotional needs in my staff, students, and families as I do now. My administrative colleagues are not immune to having our own social emotional needs. We are leaders and we often hear work-life balance. So easy to say, but the reality is we always put others first. But never have we ever been so proud of our families and staff members. We, the elementary administrators, are doing whatever it takes to make virtual learning work for students. We go on home visits because truthfully, we've been told that other staff members could not. So we deliver materials. We deliver food. We work and deliver technology and do well-being checks on families. We have organized flu shot clinics and library book distribution. We ensure our buildings are operating well and are clean and safe. We're preparing for students to return to our buildings. It takes a toll. And as a veteran administrator, I am concerned about my colleagues and new administrators, but let's be real. It's like we are all new administrators. My 31 Title I colleagues have worked tirelessly for our communities. We have provided our communities with resources and have tried to be innovative and commu with, with communication paths and with the always difficult farms application process. As a group, we brainstormed ways to fill needs for our families. Uh, excuse me, we fill needs for our families that have health needs, food, again, technology support and counseling. We as a group lean heavily on each other. Yesterday, we were told that we have to reach out to parents who have not registered for parent view and who have not completed the parent survey. Of course, this is very important work, but I will use myself as an example. I found out I have 507 parents who have not completed the parent survey. I met with my well-being team today and we will make every attempt to support parents in answering the survey. But some of the asks are very challenging and they come at a fast pace. And this especially impacts our Title I schools. I feel compelled to mention the nine sole school principals in our district. The work is endless and isolating, especially when you're leading alone. Please do not forget the years of advocating for assistant principals to be assigned to these schools. Of course, 
We do not do this work alone. Two weeks ago, I called the Clarksburg Depot and asked if they could send four workers to Daly to help with quarter two materials distribution. I received an immediate yes, and the support was so helpful. Thank you, Todd Watkins. You never say no. Barbara Harrell and Food Services put up with my numerous requests to reinstate the Middlebrook Mobile Home Park as a food distribution site. I know I bugged her, but she always returned my emails letting me know she was working on it and it was finally reinstated. Kara Trent Camp and her team have been one of the most valuable and much needed instructional supports. Thank you, Kara. Personally, my Clarksburg cluster colleagues are my lifelines. And I would be remiss if I did not mention my director, Eric Wilson. He is always there for us. I thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dietz. Next up, we have Mr. James, James Allrich, principal of Argyle Middle School. Good evening, uh, Board of Education members and colleagues and community members. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. So you've heard from several offices tonight, and you know when you think about the supports that we've received into the schools, someone or groups of, of people need to be there to actually support receiving those materials, organize those materials, and being able to get them out to our families and to our students. Uh, oftentimes those people are administrators, and we're leading that charge to make sure that our students are getting what they need. So when I think about this work that we do as middle school principals, particularly in this pandemic of COVID, and when we think about the outwardly, outwardly response we've seen around systematic and structural racism, I think about this work, if you will, in three buckets. So I think about it in terms of emotional work, I think about operations, and then I also think about the work that we do instructionally uh, to support our students, our staff, and our communities. So when I think about the emotional piece, right? So our social emotional support for students, the number of home calls that we're making homes, number of home visits, um, we're providing food at the, at the schoolhouse and, and trying to support um, our, our staff and making sure that our students are getting what they need. Um, sometimes administrators are doing welfare checks because they just don't know what's happening with students. Um, we're creating a space for our students to be able to express themselves right, in the midst of all the things that's, that's happening in this society. Um, social emotional support for us in the communities is something else that we also do. You know, creating time for teachers to be able to connect with each other, uh, for teachers to be able to, to, to get the support they need when they feel overwhelmed because you know, that lesson didn't go exactly as they intended. Maybe you know, the Zoom didn't work like they thought it was going to work. We are there to support them. Um, you know, strangely enough, you know, I think about staff members who I've never physically met. Right, that we've interviewed, they're part of the staff, and attempting to really create a community has not been easy. But really trying to create this kind of social emotional space where even as a new staff member, where you don't even know the school, but you still feel connected to our school. And we're so, so thankful to the work of OHRD, our human resources department, who've really been able to uh, get us the staff that we need. Unfortunately, at the beginning of school, late August, I had a English teacher who uh, decided to say, hey, that's it. Um, they would reach out to OHRD and within a week I had a teacher. I had a counselor, unfortunately, last month who decided that, you know, it was just too much. And within a week and a half, I had a new counselor in my building. So I'm really, really thankful for that work. So these other, the other so social and emotional supports that we're providing is, is around our families. And so school now is not just around our students, it's also around our families. Uh, one school has created work around WhatsApp where they've created a WhatsApp group for their families to be able to connect in different languages. Um, and families are not only asking what's the schedule for today, they're also asking about um, how, what are the best ways to either communicate, connect, access parent view and things of that nature. It's really been a way to provide a space and not only administrators able to connect with families, but also families able to connect with each other. I believe those things are happening because of great leadership. Um, another bucket is around operations, right? So we have to go out 
school, right, as you know, in March. And um, I remember my building, we had lockers with things in them and kids valued those things. So we had to organize all those materials, coordinated those items for pickup. Again, very thankful to the work that came out of transportation. They provided a lot of support there. Distribution pickups of materials, and study sync, English novels, materials, learn zillion. Um, just, you know, just number of things we have to do operationally to really get school running and moving. Being able to troubleshoot um, the technology. Um, you know, so many parents and students are actually calling the schoolhouse to say, hey, I don't know how to. And it's not enough for us just to send them the, the email, right, for, for tech support. We, we've made some attempts to provide that support. Um, so we, we've also become, if you will, a help desk, a tech, a tech help desk. And we've been the hub that connects students and families to all of the services that you heard earlier, that central office, and, our, that, and we know that our system is providing. This last piece, but it's probably the most important piece, is this piece around instruction, right? So as administrators, we're supporting our teachers with new curriculum, curriculum implementation, and our study sync again, and learn zillion, working with our resource teachers, our staff development teachers, um, and just making sure they're able to continue to connect in this virtual space but also making sure that they're okay. How to impact virtual learning and all aspects of that. And we know that there are many aspects of it. Um, and sometimes those aspects revolve around equity issues and we wanna make sure that we're keeping our families connected and reaching out to them. Some of our families aren't on parent view. Um, so we know that there's extra work that we need to do. It's not enough just to lean on that, making sure that we're making all those contacts. Uh, we're still doing classroom formals and, and informal observations. And, and, and the reality is oftentimes when parents and students are thinking about the work that they're doing in school, they're thinking about the schoolhouse, right? So we as administrators almost become the face of MCPS of delivering a, a level of positivity and hope. We do, our teachers do as well, um, but organizing um, and leading the work to make sure that students are getting what they need and they're feeling supported and connected are a large part of what we do. And we're so, so thankful for the work um, from our directors um, and just the support that we receive from central office. And oftentimes, you know, through this leadership, when we think about it in these three, these three areas, it's holding all these three pieces together, if you will, is the glue. That glue is what I would call leadership. So, I'm really, really thankful. Um, you know, I had a time to present to you, but I just, I just want to close with that. You know, we've been able to reimagine schools, and the reality is, we, we have to reimagine leadership, and we really look forward to your continued support. Thank you. All right, thank you, James. I really like that term, reimagine leadership. All right, so our last presentation will be Mr. Damon Monteleone. Principal of Richard Montgomery High School. Thank you, Christine. And, and thanks everybody for hanging in there, right? Through, through all these <laughs> presentations. Um, I'm gonna wrap it up here and try to bring this thing home. And so I wanna, again, uh, send my appreciation to the members of the Board of Education. Uh, I do as well. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to provide insight into the work of the high school principals uh, during the his this historic time period. Indeed, in many ways, we have redefined the meaning of school leadership over these last eight months. We've shouldered the anxiety, fears, and uncertainty of our staff, students, and families. Our priorities lie not necessarily with school improvement plans or external assessments, but with the very basic goals of one, ensuring staff and student emotional well being, two, maintaining a sense of school pride and community, and three, providing the best virtual instructional program possible under these circumstances. To meet these goals, we are restrained only by the pull of our experience, shackles of old habits, and the unwillingness to recognize that nothing, nothing is the same as it ever was. As high schools are a microcosm of society, we have listened to, cared for, and led our communities through this perfect storm of a global pandemic, a reckoning with racism, and an economic crisis, all of which, all of which have disproportionately impacted our most vulnerable families. To achieve success, we have coordinated with our administrative colleagues at Central Office. Every new action plan you've heard about, every new monitoring tool, 
Each daily email we get, each new iteration of a grading policy, a new initiative, every new well-being plan, virtual athletics, operationalizing our buildings for physical distancing, all of it comes across our desk for implementation at the school level. And not only does this require coordination with the outstanding folks at OHRT, uh, OCTO, Transportation Materials, OPSI, and OTLS, but it also requires earnest collaboration with our MCEA and SEIU staff. It requires a new leadership lens predicated upon the idea that we are all, all first year principals. And as such, we must be in a constant state of reflection and re-implementation. Since March 13th, high school principals have taken schools with thousands and thousands of students. I can hear my colleague Renee Johnson saying, well, Blair has 3,300 students <laughs> and hundreds of staff members. And we have transformed these operations almost overnight for the virtual environment. We have led our teachers in flipping 100 years of teaching culture on its head. Overnight, the profession was yanked, kicking and screaming into the 21st century. Without experience ourselves, we quickly became super users for online platforms we had never used so we could build the capacity of our staff and students. When the world was quarantining in April and people weren't leaving their homes, we were on the front lines with transportation, working with the public and working with Octo to distribute Chromebooks to every student in the school. We threw out everything we'd always known about graduation and senior celebrations and reinvented these on the fly under immense pressure from our communities, right? Trying to get it right, doing awards nights on YouTube, producing graduation videos, distributing caps and gowns and diplomas via drive-through celebratory assembly lines. And just when we were settling in, just when we thought we had it right, on May 25th, George Floyd was murdered. And the racism and divisions that have always been just below the surface in our society reared their ugly heads once more and our students demanded to be heard. They created Instagram accounts sharing with the world all the injustice, discrimination and racism they experience in our schools. We own this experience of our students and it weighs heavily upon our souls. We listened to them, we learned and we encouraged their brave efforts to make changes in this world. We partner with them in our plans to attack systemic racism in our schools and school system. As the calendar turned to July, we held leadership week without any clear idea as to what school would actually look like. We worked with OHRD to screen candidates and hire new staff that to this day, we've never met. For our first year principals, they faced the daunting task of taking over schools and building relationships with folks they had never met. A week before pre-service, we learned the final high school schedule. One week, we received the final distance learning curriculum and grading guidelines that same week, and we worked around the clock to prepare for the return of an anxiety-ridden staff. With the support of Octo, we trained hundreds of teachers during pre-service to use Canvas, Zoom, and Synergy, literally, so they could teach on day one. We prepared for the first day of school without actual schools. We had to figure out how to ensure that thousands of students knew their login information, knew how to find, and knew how to find their virtual classrooms. We manned our own school-based help desks, answering hundreds of calls daily from families who didn't know how to get into parent view. And as school began, we trained staff on administering school-wide map testing at the high school level for the first time in history. And along with folks from transportation, we collected instructional materials and textbooks from thousands of students. At RM, it was over 2,500 students. And then along with resource teachers, we sorted every single thing we collected by academic departments before then creating individually prepared student bags with student schedules and names on them with their course specific materials. Once again, we served on the front lines of this pandemic and interacted with the public, distributing these materials to ensure that every single student had what they needed. To maintain our traditions and sense of community, back to school night, PTSA meetings, open houses, and spirit weeks all had to go online. We have fostered open channels of communication with our entire community to ensure that we are listening to our staff and students that so we can adjust to the realities of distance learning in real time. And we have supported teachers, and this may be the most difficult thing. We've been supporting teachers to streamline everything they've always done for their 15, 20, 25 year careers to take 
planning that occurs over a five day week or five lessons and to cram it into two. And they've done this on the fly while, while learning new technologies, taking care of their own small children at home, trying to teach their own first graders how to read and maintaining their work-life balance the best they can. We've listened to our teachers and our staff as they have cried with exasperation. We have counseled them literally to stay in this profession. We have relentlessly focused on staff morale, which is a major issue right now. Our students have increasingly shared their extreme levels of anxiety. Our students have shared how they feel isolated. They've shared their lack of motivation. And we prioritize mental health over everything else. Forget performance data. We just wanna get our kids logged into Zoom so we know they are okay. This is our purpose now. This is our purpose. Making sure that everybody in our communities are well and maintaining a sense of school pride and community. As we look to the future, principals are working with our business administrators, our McBoa colleagues and building services to operationalize our facilities for a possible return to in-person teaching. We are beginning to rethink our second semester schedules to ensure we are able to run both simultaneous instruction and learning support models. And after one marking period, it is clear that this pandemic will be felt for years and we cannot expect our students to end the school year attaining the same standards as they have in the past. We must look to recalibrate to a pragmatic approach to what the scope and sequence and pacing of what our curriculum for students will look like next year when they come back. And we must figure out a way to assess these learning gaps. Our work as leaders is to share this long-term lens with our communities and staff and to build out the infrastructure that is necessary to meet this coming storm. As principals, we are leading our staff to reframe our collective mindset to elevate students over data points, teaching over tests, engagement over accountability, morale over mandates, mental health over perfection, collaboration over competition, action over action plans, and reality over perception. Indeed, we are literally recreating the paradigm of public education. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Wow. I just want to, I want to clap after that, Damon. Thank you so much. We are going to now open it up for questions and answers. And Ms. Evans, I'm going to ask if you would please facilitate that. And then after that, we will close. We will hear closing remarks from our Vice President of Leadership Development, Ms. Ann Dardarian. Sure. Um, so I think you took the word out of my mouth. Wow, this was um, great. Um, in terms of us getting all the information. I know we didn't get all of it. I, I know that you just touched on everything briefly. And so um, I'm definitely hoping that we can get the PowerPoints for the presentations that we were able to see online. Um, so many things stood out for me. Um, but I know my colleagues have a lot of questions, but um, you know, I, so, so everybody said something that resonated with me, but I know that I'm gonna go back to um, Dr. Cruz and I had to write it down. She said that um, for, for an episode that took 15 minutes, it took five hours to create the video. For a 1.5 hour presentation, it took 60 hours. Um, I heard Ms. Dawson talked about 1.6 million copies. Um, I just, yeah. So uh, thank you for all that you all have done. And I know we you, we say it so much. I, I, you may not even believe that we mean it. We mean it, you know, because behind all the smiles and all the work that's been taking place, um, we know there's fatigue, right? Um, we never could have imagined that this is the, the way that we would be teaching. And so, um, you know, I can never say enough that you all matter and um, we need you to do this work. And so I appreciate each and every one of you for all that you've done for um, putting your, your lives on hold to make sure that our students and their families have what they need. I'm getting a little emotional. Cause this is a lot, right? even as a board member, 
Um, I could not have imagined that I would be doing this right now, but just listening to you all is a lot. And I hope our, um, our parents and our community hears it um, because, you know, we come to the board table and we ask for things. And um, I don't know that oftentimes, I'll speak for myself, I won't speak for anybody else, that we realize um, what all it takes to, to make the work happen, um, particularly in a, in a pandemic, right? So um, just know we mean well, right? And we're not trying to push you to your limits. We're not trying to push you out of the profession because we want you here. You're all um, great leaders. As I heard um, my former principal say, Mr. James Ulrich, um, and you're reimagining that leadership and you're doing it, you're doing it well, you are. Um, so however we can try to lighten the load, we wanna be able to do that, right, as board members. And so I will um, let my colleagues ask questions. Um, I did have one and I'm, uh, I hope I don't get emails from people, but um, I know that we wanna make certain that we're able to measure the learning loss for our students. Um, but what struck me is um, Ms. Uh, Diaz mentioned um, that when we come back in January, that for 14 days, we will be um, doing map testing. So how can we, how can we um, try to manage that so that um, it's not 14 days? I know I'm asking a lot, is, and, but, it, but I, I know we have a lot to, to do to be able to manage um, the learning loss, but how, how can we do this um, as we think about being virtual? Uh, Ms. Evans, this is Jack Smith. I took a lot of notes uh, while people were speaking and that's one of the notes I took. So we will revisit and see what's, uh, what's possible and what changes we can make to uh, uh, support our schools, our students, and, uh, and our staff. Okay, so I'm sure I have more questions, but I'm gonna let the tears dry up and I'm gonna call on my colleagues and um, I'll come back if um, some of the other things that I wanna ask have not been asked. I will start off with Vice President Wolf next. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I, my only question was about the map testing because I was concerned about the last administration of it. And since Dr. Smith has already said he'll get back to us, we'll look forward to that. But you know, this presentation just confirms what we all already knew, that everybody in the system is on board to ensure the success of our students and the continued success of MCPS in general. You know, these are really challenging times and you know, whether or not the people out there know it or believe it, I wanted you to know that we know it, we believe it, we see it, and this is certainly proven to us if there was any doubt, and there never was any doubt in my mind, that everybody is doing absolutely everything that they can to ensure that our students are still getting what they need to get. I also, you know, a lot of times, uh, Shebra and I are on the same page. I, I know that everybody is doing something, but I do have to say something about Dr. Cruz because I think I see her stuff on Twitter all the time because it helps me myself because this has been challenging trying to deal with all of these meetings on Zoom, dealing with the negativity coming from our community with the overt racism coming from the community and the way making um, has just really been helpful. And I wanted her to know that. I also wanted to know her to know that the parent workshops have been tremendous help to everybody. Uh, no matter what they feel about the system, I've only heard good things about that. Of course, transportation, materials distribution, you could say something good about everybody, but um, I just wanted you to know that we do appreciate it and we thank you. Thank you. Sure, at this time, I will call on um, Mrs. O'Neill. Uh, 
Well, um, first I want to say when Nora Dietz, when you said never ever did I think that, I mean, I think all of us sitting through this evening's presentation could go dot, 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 you know, or fill in the blank for ourselves. Never did I think that in the 21st century, I'd be living through a pandemic. And, you know, um, this is not what any of us have chosen. And I think in the beginning in March, we all thought, oh, this will just be a short time. And I can't believe that nine months later, we're living through this. And, you know, I know that parents are anxious to get our get their children back in school. And, and I know that, as you said, Nora, that you really want to give a kid a high five or a hug. And, um, you know, people don't choose to go into education who are not sympathetic, empathetic, caring individuals. And so it's extraordinarily hard doing this. You know, this is the season of Thanksgiving and I am eternally grateful to everyone, all of our employees, for all of their extraordinary efforts. You know, to many people just looking from the outside, oh, it's magic. You know, those Chromebooks happen, those lunches appear. And when things don't work, we hear from people, you know, very loudly that it's not working. And, and all of our employees who are working, whether it's via Zoom or in public facing positions, also have their own fears. You know, all of us, this is an unseen enemy that's out there. And you have to worry about your own loved ones and balance, find that work-life balance. And it's not easy for anyone. So I thank you. I, I too was concerned about the MAP testing in January. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think it was very difficult this fall and I had expressed concern about the even the validity of those, how those assessment results, you know, what they really showed. I, I think we need to take things off people's plates and really kids need as much instructional time as we can possibly give them. And I know that Dr. Smith will, and Monique, Dr. McKnight will look at this but I'm really concerned, uh, especially if we are contemplating then January 12th, trying to bring in small groups. I, I just think that um, unless it's absolutely necessary, it shouldn't be done. But thank you and please express to your staff for, on behalf of the whole board, how eternally grateful we are. And I hope that even though people are being encouraged to have small gatherings uh, just with their immediate family, that they can take a few moments to take a deep breath and, re and reflect on how grateful people really are. Thank you, Ms. Silvestre. Um, well, thank you for everyone for all the information that you provided. Um, it really is quite remarkable and uh, overwhelming. Um, you know, you've given it your heart and soul and, and then some more. Um, and uh, students have it from it. Um, I know I heard a lot of things that I wasn't aware of. I see a lot of people that I see green. So I appreciate you spending some time with us tonight to better inform us and better highlight uh, the great work that you're doing. Um, some things that st stood out to me is um, you all talked about taking care of each other and how important that is. Relationships, our well-being, our connectedness uh, as we support this uh, high quality online platform. Uh, um, I did want to, um, I. I did want to ask something of you, and uh, if you don't feel this is not the time to answer, then please. And uh, I've been thinking really hard about uh, what to do about it. So, um, if anyone um, wants to reach out to me again, I, I I just think we need to talk about it and to um, think creatively and proactively about what we need to do. Um, 
ignoring it is not an option. And so um, I would love to, I would love to, for the board to have this discussion and I would love for that discussion to be informed on um, your experience out in the field. So thank you so much for everything you do and I hope you have a, a wonderful Thanksgiving. I am thankful for all of Okay, so I think my internet is a little bit unstable. I heard a little bit of what Ms. Silvestri said, so hopefully everybody else heard it and it was just um, me. Um, did I? Um, Ms. Evans, this sure. is Jack. Could we ask Ms. Silvestri? I didn't get the question yeah. at I didn't. all. Her, your voice went away, Ms. Silvestri, when the specific topics that you have been thinking a lot about and that you'd like to hear more about from the field. Or if that was just it, then then was that it? Is that what you said? You're on mute, Carla. So maybe you just need to repeat yeah. your question. I've been having trouble all evening. So um, can I put it in the chat? Absolutely, you can, and we'll make certain. And if you can't do that, we'll make certain that um, everyone gets your comment. But go ahead and put it in the chat, that way people can see it. And then I'll go to Dr. Daka. I didn't forget about you, Dr. Daka. Okay, um, as everyone knows, I've been here longer than anybody. And every department that spoke tonight, every division, I have dealt with them in different ways. Um, I know that the materials management is fascinating. There's a lot going on over there. And a lot of us don't know all the stuff that, um, that uh, is, in that division and that um, Jeannie is uh, responsible for. And Seth talking about the continuous service that they've been doing you know, with this pandemic and they've still been able to manage to keep the uh, facilities and the buildings going, uh, the SATs and uh, testing and summer programs under, um, under Scott Murphy and that department and technology. We can all say, you know, changing over to virtual, what a job for the people in technology to be able to keep up with that and to help people who are having problems and to, dev to devise programs to, to help them um, to be able to deliver the services. And as you said with uh, Dr. Cruz, uh, she's in charge of our social emotional division with PPWs and counselors. And we, we just know how important they are to everything that we do. Uh, restorative justice is something that we're dealing with. And I know uh, at the beginning, we I have forgotten who said it, was talking about anti-racist and um, making sure that we're equitable with our students. And a lot of that has to do with people that she's working with and the interactions with families. And already it was mentioned that um, elementary principals and others like Nora Dietz said, they can't be uh, on a one-to-one -one basis with their students or with their uh, parents. And Mr. Allridge talked about connecting with teachers and students and parents. And Mr. Monteleone, he, I, you just, he, we need to see his speech, I guess. I hope it's gonna be written. Um, he uh, talked about uh, the overnight changes and this is something that we've all felt. Now, we have heard from the community that we thank you too much but not in my mind. I know what you do. I haven't done it all, but I've seen you working and that's just the general you. I've seen different generations of you working. I know how superbly this school system works. I've said this many times. We have the most wonderful staff. They are very innovative. They're hardworking. Um, they're very sincere. So I'm continuing to say thank you for the kinds of work that you're doing. And I'm not embarrassed to do that. And I get irritated when questions are asked that make it sound like, well, you're not doing your whole job. Um, sometimes I make a remark about that too, but I know how hard everybody works. I really do. And I appreciate everything. And thank you for uh, all the information you've given us in the public tonight, just a snapshot of some of the things that go on in the system. Thank you. And so I'll, and I'm not sure if everyone was able to read Ms. Silvestre's comment in the chat. It's just, she said, what I said, 
what I said besides how thankful I am for your work is that I'm interested in your thoughts on what to do about staff morale. I think we need to address it and I would like the board's conversation on this to be informed by your thoughts and experiences. Please reach out to me with your thoughts. Happy Thanksgiving, I am thankful for you. So just wanted to read what she said in case everyone hadn't had an opportunity to read that. And then we'll go to Mrs. O'Neill and then I'm gonna make certain that we are able to close yeah. out. I just, I, I think the, it was a truly remarkable presentation this evening. The slides in um, everyone's remarks, if they are written out, I, I hope that we can compile them in to a, a pamphlet or historical document that leading in a pandemic because, you know, I, I, I don't want anyone to do any extra work. And I realize we're not through the pandemic, but I think that, you know, I know that a document was put together following the 30 days of the sniper a debrief on that, but I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact of all the efforts that went in into trying to get through this and serve our students. Okay, and so definitely I just wanted to um, mention technology because that's been a huge part of um, this virtual world. So that presentation was informative as well. And so I did not know, but Mr. Asante hopped on because that's the kind of um, board member that he is. He left his other event and he came on. So he wants to ask a question. So I don't I don't want to keep you all past your time, but I wanted him to be able to come on here and acknowledge you and give, and give remarks. So Mr. Asante, go ahead. Yes, good evening. Sorry, I'll keep it short. I did just want to say um, thank you for all the presentations. It was kind of mind blowing to see all the work that's being done. And I feel like, you know, as students, um, we'll log into Zooms, go into our classrooms, engage in all the different programs. And most of the time we don't see all of the behind the scenes stuff that um, goes on. But I do know just from conversations with students about virtual learning and the way that our system adapted to virtual learning, I, a lot of students are appreciative of all of the work that you're doing, very grateful for all of the work that you're doing. And I did wanna say it was great to hear about um, the discussions being had in professional teams um, around, you know, anti-racism and all of those uh, prejudice that prejudices that might exist within different teams. And I'm uh, hoping that all uh, teams throughout our system are having that. And I wanted to echo Ms. Silvestri's comments about uh, staff morale. I think it is important that, um, you know, because we heard from a lot of different principals about counseling, counseling they had to give their staff members um, in terms of like keeping them on the team and, you know, um, lifting those morale their morales. So I think it'd be great to get that feedback um, to the board about, you know, some of those conversations that were had with staff members about keeping them on the team. But other than that, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Like I said, um, all students are grateful for all of the great work that you guys do. And thank you so much for making this transition to virtual learning so um, seamless and so great. Okay. I think we have one thing. other thing. Uh, transportation. I didn't mention that, but, you know, Todd did get an award. He was on the front of a industry magazine uh, as an outstanding uh, person in transportation. But when he was talking about transportation and about staff changing their roles in order to fit in um, and knowing the kind of work that he has to do during the year, I, I don't know whether everybody realizes what goes on in transportation, all the routes that have to be changed or um, the research that has to be done before schools open and making sure that things are on time and that the buses work. Uh, it's a tremendous amount of work um, along with others on the staff. I don't, I don't mean that the others don't do as much, but transportation can be quite iffy. So thank you, Todd, and thank you everyone uh, again. And I'll just go ahead and throw in Mr. Adams. We heard you as well. So just wanted to make sure we acknowledge everyone by name. And with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Ann Dardarian. Thank you so much, board members and Drs. Uh, Smith and McKnight. It's my honor to close out our session today. I would like to leave us all with a quote about leadership. This quote says, when leaders are doing their best, they model the way, inspire a shared vision, challenge the process, enable others to act, and encourage the heart. So I think you've seen today all of the ways that the leaders in MCPS accomplish all of the active verbs that are in that quote. We are the influencers, 
We are doing so many things in so many departments and offices, and we certainly could not mention all of them tonight. I think you all recognize that if we were to do that, we would have you on Zoom probably until 11 p.m. tonight. So uh, we decided to show some mercy uh, and not do that, but that is not to slate our colleagues in any way. In every corner, in every pocket, in every office, department, we have members who are working diligently to help to improve student achievement outcomes, to work with staff, to care about well being, to do everything that we need to do as leaders to help for MCPS to be successful. Um, again, you've heard many examples of the ways that our work is seen and unseen. We are sometimes just really quietly working in the background. Um, you know, we're not always out in front, even though as leaders, you would think that sometimes that's where we should be. But a lot of times we're pushing the other people in front because we know that our role as a servant leader is to help others to be successful. So I just want to close out with saying that we lead with excellence. We led with excellence yesterday. We continue to do it today and we will continue to do it tomorrow. But excellence is nothing without leading with heart. And we've got that covered in spades. So we are honored to work for MCPS. We are honored to work with you as our partners. We're honored to work with our staff and our, you know, everyone in the system. Um, we're here with a mission and a purpose, and we hope that that came through uh, tonight. So we want to thank you very much for this opportunity. We're very grateful, and we look forward to doing it again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.